This true story revolves around Bolto, a dog with a barrel-like chest who was deemed unfit for serious sledding. However, he ended up being the lead dog of the final sled team that successfully delivered the life-saving medicine to Nome in Alaska. This true story highlights the heroic efforts of the marshes and their dogs in brutal Alaskan winter conditions, as well as the tragedy of dogs dying and of children who lost their lives to the disease. Back in late 1800s, lots of people went to the town of Nome in Alaska to find gold. But living there wasn't easy, especially during the winter when there were tons of snow and the temperature would get super cold, like negative 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It was so hard to get around and do things during those months. Travel and access to the town became almost impossible. They used dog sleds to travel and get supplies. Leonhard Sappler, a Norwegian, I'll call him Leonard throughout the story, he rented and sold sled dogs and was known as a renowned marsha, which means a person who steers dog sleds. In his kennel sometime around 1920, a Siberian husky with completely black fur, partial white markings above his belly, white socks on his front legs, and brown eyes was born, whom he named Bolto. He was not too happy with Bolto, whose barrel-like chest made him unfit for serious sledding. He was neutered at the age of six months as he was deemed too inferior to pass on his DNA. Leonard's favourite dog, by the way, was a fantastic dog named Togo. Many of you may have heard of him. However, Bolto ended up becoming more of a household name, but I will at some stage tell Togo's amazing story as well. In the winter, dog sleds became the primary means of transportation for many men who travelled to Nome looking for jobs. Bolto was rented out by a man named Gunnar Kassen. Throughout the story, I will call him Gunnar. He had moved from Norway to Nome to take part in the gold rush. There is no record as to why Gunnar chose Bolto to be the lead dog. But most people believe that it was because he felt some kind of connection from the start. He saw something special in Bolto. In Nome in 1925, there was an outbreak of a disease called diphtheria. At first, Dr. Curtis Welsh thought it was just a flu when some kids had sore throats. But a few weeks later, unfortunately, two kids died and the doctor realised that it was a highly contagious disease that had infected most of the kids in the town. The Inunet children were affected the worst because they didn't have the immunity to what they called white man's disease. Diphtheria is also known as the strangling angel because it can make the inside of the throat turn leather and people can't breathe or swallow. It's very dangerous, especially for children, and parents couldn't do anything but watch their children slowly choke to death. To prevent an epidemic, Dr. Welsh announced that all infected children needed to be placed in quarantine. The cure for diphtheria existed, but no had old expired antitoxin, which wasn't suitable to treat the sick kids. The population of Nome was just 10,000 people, and even after placing the infected under quarantine, more children were getting sick every day. Everyone was afraid that if the outbreak wasn't contained, all the children might die, and it could spread to the adults too. So in January 22nd, 1925, Dr. Welsh sent out dozens of telegrams to doctors around Alaska, and even sent a message to Washington, D.C., asking for help to get enough antitoxin. On the 26th of January, a supply of 300 units of diphtheria serum was found in the Anchorage Railroad Hospital, 1,000 miles away. While nowhere near the 1 million units that Dr. Welsh had so desperately telegrammed for, it would have to do. But how are they going to transport it? Most of the train tracks were totally iced up, so that's when the idea of the dog sled relay was proposed. The medicine would be passed on from one team to another until it reached Nome. In the meantime, John Beeson, the Anchorage Railroad Hospital's head of surgery, took measures to ensure that the medicine would not freeze. 
or break during its upcoming dog sled journey. He carefully packed the fragile glass vials of antitoxin into a cylinder with sufficient padding to prevent them from rattling around. Then he wrapped the cylinder with canvas and fur to provide additional insulation and warmth. Once the medicine was prepared, it was transported from the hospital to the nearest railroad station, where it was loaded onto the train and travelled 200 miles north to Nenana, as it couldn't continue, as the train tracks became iced up. In order to transport the medicine across the vast ragged terrain of Alaska, a team of 20 skilled marshes and 150 dogs were assembled to embark on a challenging round-the-clock relay race. These marshes were forewarned of the difficult journey ahead and strategically stationed in various towns along the route, eagerly waiting to participate in what would undoubtedly be the most significant race of their lives. The very first leg of the relay was Musha Wild Bill Shannon. He was waiting with his lead dog Blackie, and eight other sled dogs. So when they heard the whistle of the train, he grabbed 20 pound package of the serum, he carefully tied the parcel to his sled and signaled his nine sled dogs to start their journey. With every passing second, the urgency of the situation mounted as the number of confirmed cases in Nome grew. But Wild Bill knew he couldn't risk the lives of his loyal companions by pushing them too hard in the brutal Alaskan winter. The biting cold of 60 degrees below zero Fahrenheit was unforgiving and even the slightest misstep could lead to certain death. As the sleds made their way through the rugged wildness across the frozen waterways, they continued with relentless determination. Wild Bill sometimes ran along the sled trying to warm his body, but the bitter cold was unrelenting and even the most experienced of marshes were no match for the brutal conditions. Despite his best efforts, Wild Bill's body succumbed to hypothermia. His face was black from frostbite, and he lost at least three dogs during the 52-mile journey to Lavana, where he handed the serum to the second team. The next driver, Edgar Callens, warmed the serum before setting out. When he arrived at his destination, he had to have hot water poured over his hands to get them free from the sled's handlebar. Then the next team took over, then the next, and so on. Each driver had a responsibility of keeping the serum from freezing solid during transportation. At each way station, the driver had to carry the wrapped serum into the roadhouse to warm it up slightly before the next leg of the journey. However, the roadhouses were simple huts with stoves and temperatures inside was not at all very warm. One of the mushers, Leonard Seppler, was tasked with picking up the serum from a driver in Shaktalik and delivering it to another drive at Golovin for the next leg of the journey. As he and his lead dog Togo and his team of sled dogs were on their way, the organisers made changes to the plan, shortening the distances from each team and adding extra teams. Unfortunately, Leonard and his other drivers who had already left was not informed of the changes. And to make matters worse, a blizzard hit, making it almost impossible to continue the race. The organisers decide to halt the race for a while, fearing that the serum might be lost in a sled accident, but Leonard and the others were not informed. As Leonard and Togo team was nearing Shark to Lick, he passed a sled driver trying to untangle the dogs from the leads connecting to the dog sled. Normally, Leonard would have stopped to help, but this mission was too important. He and Togo and his team kept going. But suddenly, over the howling wind, Leonard heard faint cries. Seppler, Seppler, I have the serum. It turned out that the other driver was added to reduce the distance from each team. So Leonard slowed Togo down and got him to turn the team, which was a time-consuming task. Eventually, they went back and retrieved the serum from the sled driver. When he arrived at Norton Sound, his team had to divert somewhat from the planned route, but Togo knew they could return to Norton Sound and cross over the frozen bay rather than go around. This saved at least a day's travel time, but it was a lot more treacherous. It also meant that Leonard and Togo and team travelled the furthest in the blizzard than any other team by far. 
When they reached Golovin, Leonhard delivered the serum to Charlie Olsen. Charlie Olsen took the serum and continued north, only to hit gusts that drove him off the trail. But he recovered and made it to the roadhouse, where he found the next driver, Gunnar Kaysen, who had been waiting two days for the serum to get to them. Finally, he heard the sound of dogs barking, and the medicine was there. Gunnar put it on the sled, along with the stove and some food, and hitched up his team. Balto stood proudly in the lead, along with the help of another amazing dog called Fox. And with the crack of the whip, they set off into the snowy night. But the journey was far from easy. Through the freezing temperatures and the terrible conditions, the snow drifts were deep, and the dogs sank up to the necks in snow. Panic set in, and they were stuck, but Gunnar, with the help of Bolto, managed to pull the team out of the deep snow. Hours went by, and as they crossed the frozen river, the sled tipped over and the package fell into the snow. Gunnar frantically dug through the snow, but it was nowhere to be seen. He quickly got his gloves off to feel for the package as the blizzard was howling around him, and his fingers were starting to get numb. Then luckily he felt it. He picked it up, and they were on their way again. After a while, suddenly Bolto stopped short. Gunnar urged him to keep on going, but he didn't move. Then Gunnar saw that the ice was cracking, and if they fell in, they would have all drowned. Bolto had saved them all. Gunnar quickly unhitched him from the sled as his paws were wet, and he didn't want Frostbite to set into Bolto's paws if they froze. Bolto would never walk again if that happened, so he rubbed his paws with powdery snow. But Bolto was a fighter, and soon he was ready to go. The last team and his driver, Ed Roan, had believed Gunnar's team in the relay was halted in nearby Solomon due to the blizzard and the instructions were to wait it out. So they were asleep when Gunnar and Bolto made it to the final relay point. Gunnar decided to continue on, knowing that it would take precious time to wake them up, get the dogs and sled hitched up to the new sled team. So he and Bolto and their sled team, who were already exhausted, travelled the remaining 25 miles to Nome. Throughout this whole ordeal, both Gunnar and Bolto could hardly see what was in front of them. Luckily for Gunnar, Bolto relied on smell and his instincts to get them all to the safety of Nome and arrived at Front Street at 5.30am. All vials of the life-saving antitoxins were frozen, but intact and Gunnar handed them over to be thawed for use by midday. The town rejoiced and the children received the treatment they needed and many lives were saved. Thanks also to the help of the other sled dog teams that continued the relay to pick up additional serum packages. The heroic efforts of their marshes and their sled dogs became known as the Great Race of Mercy, and it remains a testament to the resilience and bravery of these very brave, heroic dogs and their mushes. Bolto became an instant hero. His name was celebrated across the country as a symbol of courage and determination in the face of impossible odds. Gunnar and Bolto were flown to Seattle for a special ceremony. Then Hollywood came calling. They took part in a movie called Bolto's Race to Gnome, which accelerated Bolto's fame. After the film's premiere, Casson and Bolto went on tour across the entire country. For nine months, Bolto and a few of the teammates, Fox, Mocktalk, Tilly, Alaska, Slim and Billy and Sly, joined the vaudeville circuit recounting their heroic story at every stop and allowing people across the United States who read about their life-saving heroism story in the paper and who saw the movie to see the famous dog in person. Then near the end of 1925, in Bolto's honour, a statue of him was erected in Central Park, New York City, where it still stands today as a testament to his legacy. And every year on the anniversary of his historic run, People all over the world gathered to pay tribute to Bolto and the story behind the race of mercy. Soon after the unveiling, Gunnar received a notice that Leonard Sapler wanted him to return to Nome. Gunnar couldn't afford to buy the passage for Bolto and the team, so he left the dogs behind with Vanderville promoter who ended up purchasing the team. After some time, Bolto and his team ended in a sideshow in Los Angeles where patrons could pay a dime to view them. 
Unfortunately, Bolto and the other dogs were neglected, abused, in some cases beaten and often stayed in chains and trapped in the Sideshows Museum. It wasn't until 1927 a businessman called George Kemble discovered Bolto in the Sideshow. The situation he found the dogs in appalled him. He was disgusted. I really feel so sad at what happened to poor Bolto, Fox, Mock Talk, Tilly, Alaska, Slim, Billy and Cy. And I'm sure you all do too. Just terrible. So George asked the sideshow owner if he could purchase them all. He said he would let the dogs go if George Kimball could come up with $2,000, which was a hell of a lot of money in those days. So he set out to raise money and with the help of the papers, telling the public what happened to the poor heroic dogs and also the help with the school kids of Cleveland and others, they raised enough money to purchase the dogs. On March 19th, 1927, Bolto and his six remaining teammates made it to Cleveland. They were given a hero's welcome as they were paraded through the town. Then, they were all sent to live the rest of their lives at the Brookside Zoo, where they were constantly viewed by the public. The first to pass away was Fox, who many thought he was just as heroic as Bolto, followed then by Mocktalk, Tilly, Alaska, Slim and Billy. Then in March of 1933, the zookeeper Captain Curly Wilson announced that Bolto's health was rapidly deteriorating. He was partially deaf and blind and had little time left. And on March the 14th, 1933, Bolto passed away, aged 14 years. Then one year later, the last dog to die was Sai. Sai missed his companion so dearly and reports claim that he was howling and howling out of loneliness. He passed away at age 17. After Bolto's death, the Cleveland Brookside Zoo gave his body to the Cleveland Natural History Museum. To keep his memory alive, his body was stuffed and mounted. The museum created an enclosed display for Bolto so people could visit him. However, Bolto's mount was exposed to artificial and natural lighting for quite some time, so this caused his pelt to fade from its original jet black to mahogany brown like it was today. Bolto is now displayed under low light conditions. In 1995, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment released an animated film called Bolto, starring the voiceovers of Kevin Bacon, Bridget Fonda and Phil Collins. Now I know a lot of people around the world and yourself, especially if you've seen the Disney movie called Togo in 2019, starring Willem Dafoe as Leonard Seppler, are feeling a little bit miffed that Togo, with the help of his team member Fritz and Marsha Leonard Seppler, wasn't showing the same love and respect and didn't receive the same sort of accolades as Bolto. I mean, when you think about it, his leg of the relay was extremely hazardous and they travelled way more than any other team. Togo saved almost a day on the relay by bravely crossing the frozen bay where almost anything could have happened. Leonard Seppler felt strongly that the true hero had been overlooked. But because Bolto was the last one that led his team to safely deliver the life-same serum to Gnome's residents still intact, He became the face of this awe-inspiring story. But really, when it comes down to it, I'm sure we all can agree that every single dog and musher that took part in the serum run deserves a medal of heroic bravery. If you enjoyed this true story, and I know you will enjoy these other true stories for animal lovers, check out the end screen or go into my channel. Make yourself up a playlist. Looking forward to seeing you all in the next video.